into Revelation now. This should be an interesting morning. Um, I, uh, I'm curious to know how many of you have read Revelation before? Okay. Okay, so, so some of what I tell you, some of you, it, it might be review, but even while I was doing my learning my talk, I learned a ton. So um, hopefully you'll all learn something. Um, so let's, let's start in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this morning. Um, and thank you so much for your word and that we have all gotten through it. We're now at the end and it's, it's glorious. It's, it's, um, it's really powerful. The, the revelation just shows your power and your glory, and um, we're in awe. And we can see that we will be in awe, laying down at your feet and praising you for eternity. And um, it's just exciting. So, Lord, I pray that right now, as these women are <clears throat> um, sitting here, I pray that you help them focus on all that will be shared and that they could process it and learn what you would have them learn today. And we just pray that you bless this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Yes, I'm talking. <laughs> Anita, do you want a mic stand? Sure, yeah. Okay. Um, my talk is a little longer today, uh, but take heart. I will not be talking next week. I might say a little bit, but so it's all going to kind of wash out in the end. Okay. Okay, I told you last week that I was going to take two weeks to explain a little about eschatology, the study of end times. Last week, I talked about the four ways that people can interpret prophecy in general. Prophecy is found in both the Old and New Testament. There is prophecy that has been fulfilled already. For example, there are many things prophesied in the Old Testament that were fulfilled in the coming of Christ. So, with prophecy, you can either read through that, the lens of being a partial preterist who says almost all prophecy has been fulfilled. <clears throat> um, except, of course, all prophecy has been fulfilled except the second coming of Christ. That's a partial preterist. You can read prophecy through the lens of a historist who says prophecy has an ongoing fulfillment that can be seen throughout history in specific people or societies. There is the lens of the idealist who says prophecy is just symbolic of good and evil and not referring to actual events. And then there's the lens of the futurist who says prophecy, particularly in Revelation, will be in the future. Nothing has been fulfilled yet. This week, I'm going to talk about some prophetic words that are found in chapter 20. The lens you wear of those I described last week will influence your understanding of chapter 20. Chapter 20 talks about a thousand year reign of Christ. So part two of your eschatology lesson is going to be how people understand the millennium, the thousand years. Now I know some of you might be crying inside right now thinking, I don't get it and I don't care. It's just too confusing. My brain isn't ready to deal with all that. I've been there and know that feeling, but take heart. No one, no one person has the whole answer to how to interpret Revelation. Scholars have been studying and debating over the understanding of it since the early church fathers. And that's okay. All Christians, no matter how they interpret it, come away from the reading of Revelation with kind of the same takeaway that you will get, and, um, and that is Christ is victorious, and he will come and get his church and take us to his eternal kingdom. 
as Paul writes in Romans, for we will all stand before God's judgment seat. It is written, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me and every tongue will acknowledge God. That's chapter 14. Hopefully my brief eschatology lesson can give you a point of reference when you get to chapter 20 so you can understand why there are different perspectives on it. So this is going to take some time to put your thinking caps on. I think it's going to be worth it. Um, <clears throat> so let's start with reading chapter 20 right now, even though I don't believe we're going to get to chapter 20 until about Saturday, but I'm going to read a, 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 quite a few verses from that chapter. So starting with verses one through three. And I saw an angel coming down out of heaven, having the key to the abyss and holding in his hand a great chain. He seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil or Satan and bound him for a thousand years. He threw him into the abyss and locked and sealed it over him to keep him from deceiving the nations anymore until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be set free for a short time. Then chapter or verse 4 says, There were souls who had not worshipped the beast. They came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Then I'm going to skip to 7 through 10. When the thousand years are over, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, and to gather them for battle. In number, they are like the sand on the seashore. They marched across the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of God's people, the city he loves. But fire came down from heaven and devoured them. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. So, we read that there is a period of time that Satan is bound while Christ is reigning with his saints. Then Satan is released, gathers a force, but is defeated and thrown into the lake of burning sulfur. I don't know if you're visual like I am. Drawing things out helps me understand things better. So I thought I would share how I drew out my notes on the three prominent views of understanding the millennium. I made copies for you and they're on your table. And if you have extra and somebody doesn't have enough at their table, hold up an extra if you have one, and then um, if we're short, maybe Linda can grab a copy or something. <clears throat> um, like I said, there are three main schools of thought on how to interpret the chapter that I just read, chapter 20. They all vary a bit, even amongst themselves, but I found they all try to answer two basic questions. Is the thousand years literal or figurative? And when is Christ's second coming? Before that time period or after? So let's start with the first timeline. On that first blank on the left, you can fill in the blank with the word ah millennial. I would have called it a millennial because in the medical field, a is the prefix to a to a word, um, it makes it mean no or without. So, a rhythmia without a rhythm, a memoria without a period, a symptomatic no symptoms. But theologians call it all millennial because obviously they don't have a medical background. <laughs> so I got to go with how they pronounce it. But in the same regards to the medical field, meaning no or without. All millennials believe that the thousand years is not a literal period. Yet, they definitely believe that the thousand year time period represents a long period of time, and it is real. A real time period representing the kingdom of God, just not a literal thousand years. So that answers the first question, number one, underneath all millennial, is it literal or figurative? It's figurative for them. An amillennial would say that the long time period, the millennia, has started already. It started when Christ first came to earth and now he is on his throne reigning. They would quote verses like Matthew 4, 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach and say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. 
in Matthew 12, 28, but if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Upon the ascension of Christ, he sat down on the right hand of God, according to Hebrews 10, and was crowned King of Kings and Lord of Lords, according to Revelation 19. 1 Corinthians 15, 55, Paul writes that Christ conquered sin and death, and Hebrews says he, Jesus, broke the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and frees those who all their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. This implies victory over Satan and a symbolic binding of his influence now that the gospel is going out into the world. So an all-millennial position says the kingdom of God where Christ is reigning is not somewhere in the far future but has already begun in a spiritual sense. The present church age is the kingdom of God that Jesus referred to. Yet his physical reign still awaits its final consummation upon his second coming. One last thing about this position is that they hold that the church, true Christians, will have a positive impact on the world and culture, an ongoing positive influence on the earth through time to be those witnesses of Christ like Jesus commanded in Acts 1.8. Even with that positive outlook of the church influence on the culture, they do believe that there will be a future apostasy where the church will become corrupt towards the end time. This will create suffering for the true Christians under the future Antichrist. They will have to endure through it. Christians will not escape this period of tribulation. They, as well as some premillennials, hold to an already not yet principle, meaning prophecy has been fulfilled, but there may be a greater future reality to the same prophecy. For example, we are children of God, having been adopted, according to Galatians 3.26. Yet we are waiting for our adoption and the redemption of our bodies, according to Romans 8.23. So already, not yet. Jesus is already crowned and ruling, but his enemies aren't under his feet yet. This already not yet principle also applies to prophecy. Isaiah 7.14 talks about a child being born, and that was true. A child was born shortly after that prophecy in Isaiah, but the rest of the verses show a greater fulfillment in the Christ child being born. Partial fulfillment and then total fulfillment. So the timeline for the odd millennial is pretty simple. On the left, Satan was bound, right at um, that, that first line, by Jesus conquering death, and then the good news goes out to a once completely pagan world according to Revelations 1 and 2 Timothy 1. The whole line is a long time period before Satan is released and deceived all the nations. So you can put one of those curly cube brackets from the first line to that first line on the right and label it all uh, the millennium or AKA the current church age, but that's the millennium. On that far right, um, on that line, you see two lines there, label the first one the tribulation with the Antichrist. And then the next line next to that, label it Christ's second coming, which includes his judgment, completion of his redemption, and the renewal of all things. And then you enter on into the eternal kingdom. So just label it Christ's return. So to review, the amillennial believes the millennial reign is in an indefinite period of time, not a literal thousand years, and it's happening now. The second question, Christ will come back at the end of that extended period after the tribulation. Now for the next line. You can write on that next blank line, post-millennial. This is the most optimistic view in respect that the church will bring greater and greater blessing to the world with its Christian ethics and spread of the gospel. And one would have to admit this has been the case. Slavery in England and America ended in large part because of Christian ethics. 
Tribes in Ecuador, for example, that were once extremely violent toward other tribes have now largely ended the practice of vengeance killing due to missionaries venturing into those jungles. Postmillennialism expects that increasing gospel su success will gradually produce a time in history prior to Christ's return in which faith, righteousness, peace, and prosperity will prevail in all the nations. This time would be known as the golden age of Christianity, or the millennium. After an extensive era, not a literal thousand years, of such conditions, Jesus Christ will return visibly, bodily, and gloriously with the general resurrection, meaning both good and bad, living and dead, and the final judgment after which the eternal kingdom follows. So remember last week I talked about partial preterists, where they um, feel that most prophecy has been fulfilled? That lens often holds to a post-millennial view of chapter 20. And let me explain. They see that the horrific predictions that Revelation describes as the judgment on Israel took place already in 70 AD. They would say that the wording of the things that sound global to us in Revelation, like a fourth of the world being destroyed, refers to Israel. So a fourth of Israel is being destroyed. Likewise, deceiving the nations would refer to the 12 tribes of Israel as the nations. So when we read that all the tribes were mourning, they don't think globally, they think all the tribes of Israel who did mourn when Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD. All that is in Revelation up to 20, therefore, has already happened. So do you see how they can think that when the gospel has spread so much to create this golden age, the millennium age, it would end with a, a period of tribulation and then the return of Christ. Not all the other stuff, because that has already happened. I challenge you to put on that lens, the post-millennial lens, at least once when reading chapter 17. Read it with the mindset that the prostitute is Jerusalem. That's not a new reference to the Jewish people. God often said they were adulterous people in the Old Testament. Reading with this lens can make sense when we read that the beast with ten horns, representing Rome, would hate the prostitute and bring her to ruin. Rome did bring Jerusalem to ruin. So post-millennials actually have a very strong argument in their favor of looking at Revelation as prophecy predicting the destruction of Jerusalem when you consider the time indicators mentioned in the book of Revelation. Revelation 1 says, um, the revelation from Jesus Christ which God gave him to show his servant must soon take place. Verse 3, because the time is near, that is repeated in Revelations 22, 6, and 10. The angel was sent to show the things that must soon take place and do not seal up the words of the prophecy of Israel because the time is near. So, on your timeline, you, you see a mark in the middle. From the first line on the left to the middle mark, you can make one of those curly Q brackets and label it the church age. That's what we're in now. Um, then make another curly Q back bracket from that middle line to the line on the right, the first line on the right, and mark that label, label that the millennium, the golden age. And the last mark, label it, um, and then at the end of the golden age is the tribulation, and then that last line is Christ's second coming, which includes the final judgment, and then goes on to the eternal kingdom. So to answer those two questions, the post-millennials say the thousand years is figurative, and when is Christ's second coming? After the millennium. I read one article that said that these two first views, all millennial and post-millennial, are slowly evolving into each other. The biggest difference between the two is that amillennials are more pessimistic about the spread of the gospel message. They feel that things are going to get worse, ending in the tribulation. The post-millennials are more optimistic. 
They feel that it's going to get better and better globally due to the effects of the gospel spreading. But an antichrist will come at the very end. I also want to quickly point out two things that the amillennial and postmillennial share that is different from the last view I'm going to explain. They would both say that Revelation 6 through 18, where it talks about the seven seals, the seven trumpets, the seven bowls, are not chronological judgments, but overlapping. So the scenes are describing the same events, which is known in the theology world as recapitulation. The last view um, that I'm going to talk about thinks that those bowls are consecutive. So, post-millennials and amillennials also share the position that the church is Israel. Remember, the church includes believing Gentiles and believing Jews. There is not two distinct redemption plans like the next group feels there is. There is one redemptive plan for all believers. That being said, the church fulfills many of the prophecies of the Old Testament. Now on to the third group, the pre-millennial view, where the post-millennial feels almost all prophecy has been fulfilled. The futurist that I talked about last week would most likely hold a pre-millennial view that some Old Testament prophecy and revelation still needs to be fulfilled. Therefore, Christ needs to come back before the millennium and use that time in the millennium to complete unfulfilled prophecies. Their timeline is a little bit more complicated, so stay with me. Um, on the left of their timeline, you could make that curly cute bracket and end it at the first of the middle lines and label that the church age. The premillennial says that there will be seven years of tribulation prior to that literal thousand year reign of Christ on earth. So label that first line in the middle, rapture. Between those two lines, you can make a teeny tiny little curly Q bracket and label that tribulation. And that second line can be labeled Christ's second coming. Futurists, often premillennials, are looking for the signs that can indicate the start of the seven years of tribulation. Because that seven year tribulation period sounds so bad, generally premillennials will say that the church will be raptured out prior to that hard time. They are known as pre-triggers, pre-tribulation. Uh, so next to that line where I said label it rapture, you could also put right there pre. Uh, yet, there are premillennialists who say, no, 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 we won't be raptured out before the hard step, but we will get raptured out halfway through it, so uh, at the three and a half year mark. So in the middle of those two lines, you can put a, a longer line in right in there, mid-trib, mid-tribbers. Um, and then there are also premillennials who believe the rapture will happen after the seven years of tribulation. They will be caught up in the air, but come down with Christ for his thousand year reign physically on earth. So you can mark that last line in the middle, the, the second line, um, post triggers. Those are post triggers. Uh, the rapture will occur for all living Christians, and they will join all dead Christians and get their heavenly bodies, come back with Jesus, and live on earth with Christ, reigning in peace for a thousand years. The time between this, um, the return of Christ and the mark on the right, you can put one of those curly through brackets and mark that time period the millennial, a thousand year reign of Christ on earth. And so to answer the two questions under the premillennial, they hold to a literal thousand years and um, Christ's second coming is before the thousand year reign. Now, during the millennium, those that lived through the tribulation, not as believers, but then become believers after the rapture, they are going to 
to have unglorified bodies. I'm going to call them mortals. That's just my own word. They're going to be mortals, but they're going to be living next to glorified Christians. Um, they will live side by side, and they will have children. The mortals will. The glorified Christians won't. And um, those mortals will repopulate the earth. Those unglorified children of, um, may or may not come into a saving relationship with Jesus while Jesus is reigning in perfect harmony. And I say may or may not because when Satan will be released at the end of the thousand years, many of those descendants who have been under the perfect reign of Jesus will be deceived by Satan. Satan will gather a great army, but he will be defeated. And then all the dead unbelievers will be raised for the final judgment that will happen on that last line. So the last line you can write, last battle, final the rapture, of the, the raising of all people, and then the final judgment. We filled out our timelines and our blanks. I'm sure your brain is full um, and you can't take any more, but I just want to add one more thing about the um, premillennial view. They are broken into two camps. There's the historic premillennial and the dispensational premillennial. Both hold to a literal view of the thousand year reign. Historics, like the other views, the um, amillennial and postmillennial, don't see a distinction between Israel and the church. Dispensational premillennialism holds a unique view in that there are two different plans, one for the church and one for Israel. Dispensationalists do not think the church is the new Israel. The church and Israel are separate entities with separate plans just for ethnic Jews. Therefore, many Old Testament prophecies, according to this view, await their final fulfillment with Israel in those thousand years where Christ is reigning on earth. They feel those Old Testament prophecies have not been fulfilled by the church. So the church age that we are in now represents what the theologians call a parentheses between the Old Covenant and the coming of the kingdom. God was working with the Jews first. He puts them on pause while he works with the Christian church. Then he comes back to the Jews to finish up what he had been doing with them. Dispensational premillennials would look at verses like when Jesus says in Matthew 24, 15, so when you see standing in the holy place the abomination that causes desolation spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand. From that verse, their understanding is the temple needs to be rebuilt, sacrifice is reestablished, and then the abomination that causes desolation could be could occur. Uh, so where amillennialists, historic premillennialists, and postmillennialists agree that the church is the fulfillment of Israel, dispensationalists distinguish strongly between Israel and the church. So there you have it. Theologian Millard Erickson says all three millennial positions have been held virtually throughout church history at different times one or another has dominated. From this exercise, I hope you see similarities between the views. I like how Michelle said last week, there are things we can know with certainty. Symbolically or figuratively, everyone agrees that Satan is bound in one form or the other during the millennial reign. There will be a time of tribulation where he's not bound. Yay. Yet, Christ is victorious, and then he will usher in his eternal kingdom. None of these views deny the basic eschatology of the Apostles' Creed, which says he will come to judge the living and the dead. So make yourself ready for that. Here ends your eschatology lesson for today. And you have till 10.30 for your time call.